Um, I received an email from Leslie and Peter Butcher, who, as you know, um, founded um, <coughs> God's Love in Action and um, set up the Centre of Hope um, in Dorohoy in Romania. And um, I think you will have read, and it was announced at the church meeting, that um, the Mission Outreach Group have used the contingency fund that we had to send £500 both to BMS World Mission um, for their work and ministry in <coughs> Ukraine and also £500 to Dorohoy, to the Centre of Hope, um, because they have been receiving and assisting and providing succour to refugees. Um, and this is the email from Leslie and Peter. Dear friends at UBC, thank you so much for your donation of £500 towards the help that we are giving the Ukraine refugees at the Centre of Hope. Leslie and I have been here since last Sunday to help our team. In that time, we have seen several families passing through the centre, arriving at various times of the day and night, exhausted from long journeys. We have just said goodbye to one family that set out from Kharkiv on 3rd March and arrived at the centre on the 14th March and traumatised from leaving loved ones behind, husbands, partners and family members, many whose houses have been destroyed. We are thankful to God that we are able in his name to offer a place to rest and refresh, a place of quiet and peace, which many comment on. It is very humbling. Please excuse this being a short email, but we are very busy, but value all your help and prayers. God bless, Peter and Leslie. Amen, thank you. So um, our Bible reading this morning is a very short one, just three verses uh, from the beginning of Philippians uh, 3 and verses 1 to 3. So Philippians 3, 1 to 3. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Jesus Christ and who put no confidence in the flesh. Amen. Let's pray. Father, once again today we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that whatever I say would be superseded by what you want to say to all of us or any of us. Lord, may we hear you speaking by your spirit into our hearts. We pray this, Lord, for your glory. Amen. The theme for today is how to protect ourselves from spiritual threats. <coughs> you might think, well, how on earth do you get that from that passage? Hopefully, I will show you in a few moments. How do we protect ourselves from spiritual threat? How do we protect the church? How do we guard our faith and the faith of those around us? Some things in the spiritual life should be repeated over and over again. And we need to repeat them to ourselves and also to others for protection. You know, as Christians, and this is not going to come as a surprise to any of you, I know that. As Christians, there are many threats to our spiritual well-being. We've got a threat within. Our human nature, in its natural self, opposes the will of God. If that, and if that's not bad enough, then we have constant temptations and per even persecution sometimes from the world around us. And of course then, in the spiritual domain, there's Satan and his minions who wish to upset the will of God, the flesh, the world and the devil. 
Those are the things that we have to ensure we are protected against. And you can add to that all the, the general consequences of sin in this world and the mess that it's in because of the way that it, that it lives. Life is hard at times. And for believers, actually, it can be even harder. I will say to you, Satan will leave an unbeliever alone. He's happy for them in their state. He's not happy in our state. But in this passage, there are several principles about guarding our faith and the faith of others. And I will go through them fairly quickly. Believers must protect themselves by remaining in fellowship. I'm sure many of you will have heard the illustration that Charles Spurgeon is supposed to have used when he's visiting a, a member of his congregation who hadn't been very much recently. He was, they were sitting around a fire and he took one of the coals out of the fire and placed it on the hearth. And they sat there watching the coal go cold while the rest of the fire raged. The point we will stay on fire for God when we remain in fellowship with other believers. When we are part of the church. Of course, that doesn't just mean being together on Sunday. It means sharing our lives. It means, you know, reading the word together, praying together, <clears throat> meeting the challenges of this life together. And here in this particular this verse, the first verse, Paul calls the Philippians his brothers and sisters and then seeks to protect them by instructing them. As a loving family member, one in fellowship with them, he sought to protect them from various threats to their spiritual health. You know, this is true for us all. If we want to remain healthy, then we need to fellowship with other believers. Who will hold us accountable, one to another? They, us, us, them. God has given us spiritual fathers and mothers. He's given us spiritual brothers and sisters to help us grow and for whom we can help them grow and to protect us from the things that might seek to draw us away from God. I don't think we're very good at this in our land, this whole idea of being accountable to one another. It's too much of an individualistic spirit, I think. But we need to allow other people to speak into our lives, to hold us accountable, and for them to do the same. Who are you challenged by? Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's difficult sometimes. We can get hurt feelings if somebody says to us something that's difficult. But if it's going to protect us, if it's going to protect us spiritually, then it's so important. The second thought is this. <clears throat> we should protect ourselves by guarding our joy. Guarding our joy? What does this mean? Well, Paul speaks here of rejoicing in the Lord. Why is our joy in the Lord so important? And why is it going to protect us from a spiritual th threat? Well, first, we should understand that it's a joy, and I know most of you will know this, it's a joy that comes not from circumstances, but from a relationship. You know, we can rejoice whatever our circumstances. We might be poor, we might have lost someone, we might um, have failed, all sorts of things. We can still be joyful in the Lord because it's overflowing from our relationship with him, not from anywhere else. And it's a fruit of the Spirit, part of the fruit of the Spirit of God that comes. And as we abide in God's Spirit, as he gives us joy, there is a protection why? Because when we're in Christ, when we're enjoying that relationship, we are held back from what it may be that Satan's trying to throw at us. It's 
We maintain our joy in the Lord by choosing to avoid anything that can steal that joy. If we're focused on our relationship with him, then we won't be focused on the other things, the negative stuff. We won't be worrying so much. We won't be anxious so much. We won't be so likely to sin or live in some sort of discord with other people. We won't be tempted to meditate on our things that are not of God. Things that will steal that joy. Guarding the joy that God gives us is one important thing. You can tell a believer who's close to the Lord. You can tell very easily their demeanour, their face, their everything about them displays the joy of the Lord. The third thing is that we protect ourselves by living in the word of God. Now, that may be very obvious, of course, very obvious indeed, but it still needs to be said. I wonder how, uh, have you ever had any period in your life where you've, um, uh, perhaps your, your relationship with God has been a bit of a struggle and you've not perhaps read the scriptures as, as often as you would have in the past? You will know, I know from my, for myself, that that's a damaging place to be. Because reading God's word, reading the Bible enriches our walk with him, enriches our relationship with him. The Philippians were being told to do that. Of course, they were being told to read again the things that Paul wrote to them, which, of course, has become the word of God. This letter was meant to be a protection for those Philippians. And it's the same for us. It's one of the primary ways that we guard ourselves spiritually as we live in the word of God. As a person growing in our relationship with God, we need that special um, relationship with him through his word. You know, our relationship with God is a bit like a spiritual thermometer. Our, our, our relationship, sorry, I've got that wrong. Our relationship with, our, the, with the word of God is a bit like a spiritual thermometer in measuring how well we are in our relationship with him. You get that? It shows us where our spiritual life really is. And it will guard us from those threats. Believers protect themselves by watching out for false teachers. Now you might say, oh, that's only a problem within the first century church. Which, and Paul talks about it in, a, in very... <laughs> in a very brutal way in verse 2 he says watch out for those dogs those evildoers those mutilators of the flesh Paul's referring in this case some, to some false teachers who were implying and you find this if you look in Acts chapter 15 because it happened in Antioch it, for the first time the church there you find that they're suggesting that you know you can't be a Christian just by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. There has to be a few add-ons. There has to be some extra bits. You have to take the law of Moses. You have to apply all the other things that the, the Jews of the day were doing in order to be, they thought, to be saved, to come to a relationship with God. And the church in Jerusalem ultimately said, no, that's not the case. But it still went on. It still went on. Wherever you found a small group of believers in the, in the New Testament, wherever it was in the Mediterranean, you might find there'll be some of these Judaizers who were there endeavouring to change the way they live, take away their freedom. There's a whole letter, uh, Paul's letter to Galatians is almost entirely written for this purpose. But that's not the case, that's false teaching. Now we may not have the same false teaching in our world today as there was in the Roman world, but there are plenty of false teachers around. There are groups that deny the deity of Christ. And those who teach health and wealth doctrine, for example. There are all sorts of uh, discrepancies, just sort of little things that don't, don't add up. We need to be firm in our faith. We need to watch out for those things. Many people have been caught out, tripped up. We need to know the truth because, as Jesus said, the truth will set us free.
And the last one. We need as believers to protect ourselves by developing an assurance of our salvation. Over the years, I've met a number of Christians who've really seemed to struggle to know without any doubt that they are loved by God and part of his family. They constantly seem to, to, to worry about that. We have to understand, again from the scriptures, that that is a truth that we have. That is a guarantee. That's what this table was all about. The importance of developing an assurance of is, is to protect us. And it's taught again and again and again throughout the, Old, throughout the New Testament. Listen to this one. This is Peter saying in one of his letters. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And Paul taught similarly. He said, Put on the helmet of salvation to stand against spiritual attack. What is the helmet of salvation? It's the understanding here that you are a child of God and that no one can take that away from you. The assurance of salvation. A person who's struggling with understanding whether they're truly gods or not, is, is someone who's prey for the enemy. The Bible teaches everywhere it's the necessity of knowing that we are truly born again, truly saved. Paul says this in Acts 2.20. Sorry, it said in Acts 2.20, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. And later on, Paul said, repent and now prove your repentance by your works. One of the ways that we know that we are God's and saved by him is how we live, how we live that out in our lives. Now, we're not saved by the work that we do, need to be clear about that but it does show a demonstration to the world around us that we are those who understand that God loves us so how do you protect yourself from spiritual threats how do you protect the church how do we guard our faith and the faith of those around us because the attacks come from all directions from, our, from the nature, from our own nature, from outside, from the world, and from the spiritual do do domain, the powers of darkness. Paul gives us this strategy. As believers, we protect ourselves by remaining in fellowship, by guarding our joy, by living in the word, by watching out for false teaching, and by developing our assurance of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to remember again that there is a spiritual battle that's going on around us. And we are not neutral. We are on your side. And we are targeted by the enemy. Lord, we don't need to get par paranoid about this. But we do need to recognise the truth of it. And as we are reminded in scripture, we don't want to get mixed up in civilian affairs, but be soldiers of Christ, serving you. Father, the pictures from Ukraine of young men and women taking up arms remind us again as a visual reminder of moving from that civilian life to one of war. Help us, Lord, 
in the spiritual domain to be constantly aware of this and to live our lives worthy of the gospel and for your glory. Amen.